In the previous presentations, we've been looking at the ancient empires of the Middle East. In this presentation, we'll look at the start of Islam and the golden age of the Islamic Empire. Islam started with Muhammad, who lived in Mecca, deep in the Arabian Peninsula. This was in the 600s. In the previous presentations, when we looked at the ancient empires of the Middle East, we sort of ignored Arabia. And that's because the Arabian Peninsula was just too harsh of a climate for the ancient empires to develop population centers. The developed portion of the Middle East in the 600s were controlled by the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Empire. The Sassanid Empire was a revival of the ancient Persian Empire. The center of the Sassanid Empire was in present-day Iran. The Byzantine Empire was a continuation of the Roman Empire, and there actually never was a Byzantine Empire. The term Byzantine has been made up by historians. The Roman Empire had been divided in half, with Constantinople as the capital of the eastern half. But it's very difficult to refer to the Constantinopolitan Empire. Whew. Fortunately, Emperor Constantine built his new city on top of a fishing village called Byzantium, so it's much easier to say Byzantine. And besides, the western part of the Roman Empire fell to the barbarians in the 500s, so the term Byzantine also serves to describe the eastern portion of the Roman Empire that continued after the fall of the western half. Now in the early 600s, the Byzantines and the Sassanids fought a series of wars that weakened both sides, and neither really paid much attention to the Arabian Peninsula, because it was such a barren land, it was incapable of sustaining human lives or development. Now the few people who lived here were loosely organized by tribes and families who fought each other for control of the few water holes. The land of Yemen to the south was different. The mountains in this region actually collected rainwater so farms could flourish. They grow coffee here today, and I think that this was the place where they figured out that they could make a drink from the coffee bean. Now Mecca was a city on the caravan route between Yemen and the cities to the north. Mecca was, in fact, the most important city on this trade route. Mecca was also an important religious city because of the Kaaba, the black stone. Travelers from all over the world place their idols on this stone. There is even a figurine of the Mother Mary and, and Jesus. People on the Arabian Peninsula made regular religious pilgrimages to the Kaaba. So Muhammad came from a forgotten part of the world. But within that region, he came from one of the most important cities, and he also came from the family that ruled that city. Muhammad often walked alone in the hills outside of Mecca. On one of these lonely sojourns, he claimed to have met with the angel Gabriel. As a Christian, I say that Muhammad claimed that I suppose that if I accepted the claim that Muhammad talked to a messenger of God, then I would have to become a Muslim. Now, there are hundreds of millions of devout Muslims all over the world who believe that Muhammad did actually speak to God's messenger. Now, we can dispute over whether Muhammad did talk to Gabriel or whether he spoke to some other entity. We could go on and on about that. But one thing that we cannot dispute is that Muhammad made a profound and lasting impact on the world. Muhammad wrote down his revelations, and these, along with his interpretation of the Old Testament, became the Quran. He told people in Mecca what he had seen and heard. His wife, Khadija, believed him, and she is revered today by Muslims as the first convert to Islam. But few other people believed him, and they forced Muhammad, along with his wives and his few converts, to leave Mecca. They traveled north to the city of Yathrib, which later became known as Medina. This journey is known as the Hijra, and the year when it occurred is regarded as the first year of the Muslim calendar. It's important because you have the creation of the Muslim community, the Ummah. When they came to Medina, many more people accepted Muhammad's teaching. Ironically, Muhammad wanted to work with the Jewish people in Medina. He even told his followers to pray facing Jerusalem. But there was a disagreement. Some say that Muhammad massacred the Jews. Others say that he simply forced them to leave the city. 
Then Muhammad commanded his followers to pray facing towards Mecca, which being in Medina meant that they were turning their back on Jerusalem. Eventually, Muhammad gathered a small army in Medina and they made several attacks on Mecca. After several battles, the people of Mecca surrendered and Muhammad entered the city in a triumphant procession. He took all the idols from the Kaaba, but the black stone remains today as a focus of worship in Islam. Two years after entering Mecca, Muhammad died. The entire Ummah, the Muslim community, mourned his death. Then they set upon the task of naming a new leader. Some people thought that Ali, Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law, should be the new leader, and we'll get more into that later. The leaders of the Ummah chose Abu Bakr to be the first caliph. Caliph simply means successor. Two years later, Abu Bakr died, and Omar was chosen as the next caliph. Omar sent the Muslim warriors on the first jihad, or the holy war, and we'll take a closer look at the concept of jihad next time, along with other details of the Islamic religion. If the Muslims had stayed in Arabia, their religion would have eventually died out. But the Muslim warriors charged to the north and quickly defeated both the Sassanid and Byzantine empires, who had weakened each other with a series of wars. The Arabs conquered the Mediterranean coast and Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers. Then they pushed both east and west. The Sassanid Empire ceased to exist as the Muslim Arabs pushed into present-day Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. The Byzantines lost control of Egypt, but they kept the Muslims out of Anatolia. Then the Arabs swept across the deserts of North Africa. In 711, the Muslim warriors crossed the narrow straits and invaded Spain. The Muslims conquered the territory of what is now Spain, and they crossed the Pyrenees Mountains into present-day France. Then Charles Martel led the army of the Franks and stopped the Muslims at the Battle of Tours. This was in 732. In just 100 years after the death of Muhammad, the Islamic religion spread from the Atlantic Ocean to the land of the Indians. Many Europeans at this time feared that their land would be conquered by the Muslims. And the letters have survived from the popes in Rome at, at this time. So we know that they regarded the Muslim invasion as the invasion of the Antichrist, the beast that was prophesied in, in the book of Revelation. After a while, the Arabs lost the energy to conquer new territory, and the lines between Muslims and Christians stabilized. The Arabs made their new capital in the city of Damascus for about 150 years. Then they built a new capital in Baghdad. The new Islamic empire grew prosperous, collecting taxes from non-Muslim subjects over a wide and vast territory. Baghdad also became a center of commerce for the entire world. Merchants came from India with spices, from Africa with ivory, they came from China with silks and the secrets of making paper. Merchants also came from Russia and other parts of Europe with furs and timber. All of this commercial activity made Baghdad one of the wealthiest cities in the world. This allowed the caliphs to fund artists and scholars. Arab scientists excelled in astronomy and mathematics. This is where they came up with the principles of algebra, which comes from the Arabic word algebra, or the balance. Arab artists produced a wealth of poetry and songs, and Baghdad came to be a magical kind of place where a person could believe that people flew around on flying carpets. Now there is much to say about the great advances made by the Arabs, but I'm just about out of time. I'll summarize by saying that this was one of the best times ever to live as a Muslim. Now it's been said that some Arabs want to take the world back to medieval times. And this is true. Muslims exerted great influence and power in medieval times. And there are many Muslims who would love to return to these days. Europeans, of course, have no interest in going back to medieval times. In those days, Europe was in the grips of feudalism. It was a time of intellectual darkness in Europe when no scientific advances were, were made. Medieval times were harsh for Christian Europeans, but it was a golden age for the Muslim Arabs. And so it's certainly clear to see why many Muslims would love to take the world back to the medieval times. Well, next time we'll take a closer look at the religion of Islam.